Good morning, everyone. So I'm here today to talk about uh, what HBE has been doing uh, in the world of big data in terms of where we've been at with our research. So I started at HP in our, our R&D function, so I came from HP Labs, it's where I started, uh, and I moved into our enterprise services division about five years ago. And in that role, I've uh, been the uh, chief uh, technology office, uh, trying to understand how we can find capability gaps in what we have in our portfolio with what the market needs and what research and development is ongoing in our labs, and then trying to take that to the market. As an example of that, uh, here's what I'll be talking to you about today, which is DNS malware analytics. So specifically, we were trying to understand how we could uh, monitor our, D our DNS infrastructure to identify new attacks on our network. In addition, uh, I was then responsible for commercializing that and taking it out to the market, and we launched this back in September. And this is an HP Labs technology. So there are many models for how uh, security operations uh, should work. Now, my particular favorite is the Carnegie Mellon University's instant life cycle. Uh, now, as I'm sure you're all aware, when an attack takes place on the network, it goes through a number of stages, particularly around the infiltration stage, the uh, lateral movement stages, the capture and the exfiltration stages. These are particular interests to us in terms of the uh, the signatures that we can find from particular malware. So that's not to say we do signature matching, but at least. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. That's not to say that these are particular signatures that we're matching upon. It's just that they, these things exhibit certain patterns, and they're really useful to learn about. So assuming that uh, an attack is taking place on a network, it generally starts to generate artifacts, and it's our ability to listen for these artifacts and be able to capture those and process those, which really determines how effective we will be in identifying these threats on our network. Now, as you heard earlier on today, on the remediation side, there's already a, a quite a significant problem in security operations. It just takes too, too long to go through existing testing processes to make sure that whatever fix are recommended are recommended that these aren't going to affect the net network. In addition, on the uh, front end, we have the challenge that actually, are we even collecting the right data? What's the fidelity of this data? The, the things we're capturing off the, off the network and from endpoints and from logs, is this really telling us that, you know, easily that this is going to be a true positive incident or is this going to be a false negative? So with that in mind, we're interested in using big data to really hone in on what data we should be looking at on the network, and that's why specifically we chose DNS, to understand what threats were on our network. And at the same time in labs, we're looking at using software-defined networking to have a rapid response mechanism as we find threats, whether that's for quarantining or for assisted triage. So for those that aren't aware, this is the process that takes place to perform a, a DNS resolution. So in this example, I'm querying service.company.com. Now to do so, I have to first have to connect to a recursive resolver on my corporate network. And then that makes a connection out to uh, the root servers if they're not cached. And it looks up, well, who's responsible for .com? Because I need to go ask them who's responsible for company.com. So that takes place. And that is then an iterative process until we get down to company.com. And we can ask them, well, what's the alias for service.company.com? So in this case, we see that that's resolved to an IP address. Now what's interesting here is if we're analyzing the queries going out of our network and the responses coming back in, if we take this as a, as a big data source, actually we can get a lot of useful information out of this. One, we can actually start building what's called a passive DNS database. So we can look at all the queries that have ever gone through our network and we can compare that in the long term. So have these records changed somewhat you know, over the course of months, weeks, years? In addition, we get real-time insights about uh, individual endpoints on our network. Has their querying nature changed over the last 24-hour period? Have they queried domain names for the very first time? Uh, what sort of domain names are they, are they uh, querying? What, what features are there about these domain names that they're querying? So if DNS is so critical to the internet, why would someone want to abuse it? And in this example here is a great 
is a great case. We heard about botnets earlier on and uh, how they can affect organizations in terms of uh, leaking I IP from the organization or even attacking consumers and getting uh, access to uh, assets. In this example here, you can see that a given domain name has been registered. In this case, it's the one in orange. But out of all the DNS queries going through our network, how are we to know which of these were the ones we should have been worried about? Because ultimately, uh, algorithmically generating uh, domain names, uh, which are in uh, a lot of uh, botnets these days, will actually generate all these queries, and we'll, we'll see all those go out for our network. But only perhaps one in this case is the one actually resolves back to an IP address. All the others come back with what's known as an NX domain, so a non-existent domain name. So which ones of these should I be worried about? And actually, if I was listening to all these DNS queries going through the network, what patterns can I build up ab about these endpoints? So this is an example which, when we initially started this research project, we kind of theorized about as an interesting uh, possibility. The idea here being is that we have an asset on our corporate network, and an adversary has installed uh, a piece of malware, so a remote access trojan, which is uh, taking a file, breaking it up into pieces, base64 encoding uh, that, uh, the various chunks of that document, and then using those as subdomains to a domain name which is under their control. As you can see in the example, all we see going out is uh, what appear to be random subdomains to a given domain name. So we've already seen this, having deployed this in customers in the wild. So this is an attack which uh, adversaries are using to exfiltrate uh, data through our networks just using DNS. And as we all know, most people don't really like to be uh, too restrictive around what DNS uh, are blocked. So obviously, I'm here today to talk about big data. And perhaps some of us are wondering, well, why are we talking about DNS? Well, the reality is DNS is actually a very large data set in all of our organizations, I and mean, we just take it for granted. So on the screen behind me, you can see that we have the scales from routers, VPN traffic, McAfee EPO, and Active Directory, the sorts of uh, quantities that we deal with on a daily basis in security on the HPE network. In addition, this is only from one of our six next generation data centers. So times all these values by six, please. So as you can see, web proxy is pretty substantial. It's above any other, and that's generally where what most organizations start to worry about when they want to uh, really uh, drill into security. They start thinking about, let's analyzing web proxy data. But let's look at how DNS compares to even web proxy. We can see it's an order of magnitude larger. And actually, if I now jump from a logarithmic scale to a linear scale, you get to see the true scales that we're dealing with here. It really is a large data set. And so in order to even handle this sort of data, we had to devise some really smart ways to process this. So the first thing was uh, we looked to use uh, uh, field programmable gate arrays. Uh, so these are uh, uh, process-specific instructions, sorry, uh, application-specific processes, uh, which are designed to uh, be attached to a network card. And these things essentially accelerate all of our network packet processing. In addition, we have to do extreme filtering. So we use a whitelist and a blacklist to understand what things are known to be good out of the internet and which things are known to be bad. So both of those are, are generally openly available. And we then use this to uh, create what we call the gray list. So it's everything that wasn't uh, captured within that whitelist or that blacklist, and, but it's everything that was captured off the network. So that's our gray list. And this is what we then sent through for processing. So this is all these, those DNS queries and responses. And these get placed into our large database, where we will then feed them back into our ArcSight instance uh, to really understand uh, how we might triage these events. And that's you know, your general SOC process. So this isn't a theoretical project. We have commercialized this. And this is uh, a screenshot from our uh, DNS control room uh, in our research lab. So uh, I apologize for the resolution here. It's come from a 2 by 4 k screen, so uh, it's pretty large. Uh, but as you can see, on the top left here, this is the, uh, the data set for how many queries we've, 
we've dealt with in an individual day. And on that day, that's about four and a half billion. Uh, we ha uh, just so you're aware, our network consists of about 325,000 endpoints. So, we, you know, we handle quite a large amount of data going through our network on a daily basis. Here you can see an example of where perhaps algorithms can't always generate the, uh, the results we require. So instead, we're looking to rely on human analysts to spot uh, graphical patterns. So this is where it's actually quite obvious to us, even as uh, uneducated users of the system, that there's a particular problem around certain, certain devices up there because there's a, a clustering nature to that. In addition here, we then have a, an ability to drill down into an individual endpoint and pull off all the queries it's made within a given day. So this then helps with our triage process as well. And as, as I said, this is now being commercialized. It, it was known as Big Data for Security when it was a re research lab project. It's now known as DNS Malware Analytics. And there's a number of uh, ways to purchase this, and I'll be more than happy to talk to you on the trade floor. And this is how such a thing would be uh, implemented in a corporate network. Essentially, you have various capture modules which sit in between uh, your endpoint estate and the, uh, your DNS uh, server infrastructure. And then this is then processed uh, live in the cloud. So this is how we're currently dealing with threats today. What I'd now like to talk to you about is something more conceptual. And this is because already we've seen that DNS kind of pushed us to the limit of what we could process in real time. We already had to use full programmable gate arrays. As I'm sure you can probably uh, assess for yourselves, that's already kind of on, on the bleeding edge. Where we want to go now, though, is, well, beyond DNS, we have really interesting stuff like NetFlow data. We've got all the various application logs that we could be bringing in. How would we process all of this data, uh, both real-time, near real-time, and historically? And this is why we're looking to what's called the security machine. So generally, those data rates have been quite linear till now. But like I said, we're now on the point where we want to start processing far more larger amounts of data. I mean, if you can compare even DNS to NetFlow, NetFlow is really two or three orders of magnitude larger in its size compared to even DNS. And as I showed you earlier on, DNS was already larger than anything else we were dealing with. However, at the same time, we've, got, we've hit this problem with uh, Moore's law kind of expiring. And that's where we, we're kind of trailing off in terms of our, our growth of the silicon each year. So, how are we going to uh, think to address this? So we think about a traditional uh, computing architecture, the von Neumann architecture. We have uh, uh, DRAM uh, att physically attached to the CPU, which then relies on a couple of bus to then connect to all the other peripherals in the system. What we'd like to do, and we're actively researching how to do this, is essentially move to what's known as von non-volatile memory. So we'd like to uh, remove all spinning disks from the system, flash memory from the system. Instead, we, we want to start using, uh, ultimately, our memorist technology to understand how we could be processing all of this in RAM rather than in long-term storage. In addition, as you can see, we're going to re-architect the bus. That's now going to be running on photonics. So we now have very fast access between uh, processing, uh, and this is, again, applica application-specific processes into that memory. And so when I'm talking about memory here, I'm talking about very large pools, because if we're no longer running on copper interconnects, we can now start stacking this, these sorts of memories and then getting very fast access to them with very fast read-write times. The, the other paradigm we want to change here is the idea of the processor being up at the heart of the computer. Here, we're now instead thinking about moving to a world where memory is at the center. And so instead, you have individual uh, systems on a chip connecting to a very large memory pool in the center where they can access any, uh, p they can petition that memory however they like, and other processes can then also access that same working memory. So some of the performance gains we're looking here are really about collapsing this classical memory hi hierarchy. And this is to create what we call universal memory, a form of non-volatile memory. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, a lot of operating systems at the moment are architected on 
the idea of that uh, memory hierarchy. They're designed to take care of things like caching. They, they fetch uh, uh, memory from main memory into the caches, into the registers. So we'd like to actually collapse much of that hierarchy. In addition, we want to use uh, application-specific processes. Uh, for those that aren't aware, we already do quite a lot with this already uh, around HP Moonshot. It's a 45 cartridge uh, chassis where you can slot in uh, v the various blades at the top, so from field, gr field programmable gate arrays uh, to CPUs to GPUs into the chassis already, and you can get uh, th the performance for the workload required. So we're going to take that model and then put it into our machine as well. And now this is the really interesting one. If you're running off photonic interconnect, well, suddenly now distance doesn't really mean anything to us. So within, even within a data center, any uh, SOC, so any node within that system, can then access memory from any other node, all within the same data center. So you can have an addressability of about 640 terabytes of main memory. So that's quite an interesting proposal for the sorts of security problems we won't be able to address with that. And this is really the crux of uh, my talk. It's called the security machine. It's where we want to go in the next few years. Being able to go from today where we, you know, most security information event management systems top out around the 50,000 events per second, we really want to hit that up to about uh, 10 million events per second. That's the ingestion rates we want to cope with and also the rate at the same time as doing correlation. So whilst talking about correlation, we also want to really change those correlation windows. Today, because of the limited amount of main memory in our systems, uh, we can really correlate, depending on the complexity of the rule set, really about five minutes worth of data. So we have to see event A happening within a, 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 a time zero, and then within the next five minutes, if event B happens, we can easily correlate that. Well, if we're holding all this in 640 terabytes of main memory, that suddenly changes how much memory we can, oh sorry, how many events we can address. We can now have a moving event window of potentially up to 14 days. And so we're trying to understand what sort of security threats we might be able to capture there. I mean, how many adversaries can afford to play out an attack over 14 days versus five minutes? Uh, this really concludes my talk. It's I just try to uh, set expectations for where we want to go in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have a commercially available product already, so, uh, and we capture that not just from an individual system, but then we can uh, correlate across those various capture points within one given network as well. And I believe on the future roadmap, we're also looking to then correlate against other customers, but obviously there are uh, privacy issues and, uh, court, uh, sorry, and uh, contractual issues there to navigate first, but that's where we want to go in the long term with that. Fantastic. Uh, do we have uh, any other questions? Final question, perhaps? Get one right at the back. What are the timescales you see from moving from your know, five minutes to 14 days? Um, so, sorry, I should have prefaced this with that. So HP Labs' vision of the future is one from three years to 20 years. So they, they really do try to look at, you know, what changes are happening in the threat model, you know, currently and then trying to infer from that where we need to place our bets over the next 20 years to understand how we might react to those changes. So I can't really commit to when we'll see this uh, come out as a product, but we're working on it. That's fantastic. Okay, one question. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it would be nice to maybe see some kind of comparison to different uh, solutions in the field maybe already or that. It might be used for similar things like Hadoop, uh, MapReduce, uh, uh, Spark maybe, uh, have you, have you anything like that handy uh, to see how it performs better to, to the technologies I mentioned. Sorry, you mean uh, with relation to the, the security machine? Yes. 
Um, so, as I said, at the moment, this is a conceptual uh, piece of work. So we're trying to understand what physical properties this machine might need to have first, and therefore what problems we can then address. So at the moment, I, I couldn't really give a particular comparison. No more questions? Oh, one more question. Yes. Are you doing all this in-house, or are you going to outsource uh, some of this? Uh, so we don't do silicon fabrication in-house. So naturally, we will rely on partners for those sorts of parts. But certainly, the building of the system itself, yeah, that's what we're building in-house. OK, thank you very much indeed. Oh, one more. OK, one yeah. final question. Yeah, you, you mentioned FPGA devices a couple of times. Actually, that, that to me, is, is interesting on its own. And uh, I wonder if you, if you use these uh, tools to, I don't know, to build narrow nets in them or, or different uh, data mining uh, models inside FPGAs to, to speed up computing. And, I don't know, to use it to detect uh, malicious threats or something like that. Um, so certainly uh, we worked with uh, external customers to look at fraud detection on FPGAs. But that's not related to this specific project. This project, we're looking to use the, sorry, we are using the FPGAs purely just for extraction of uh, network traffic. So offloading really that from the CPU. Yeah, I, I know I did sidetrack, but it's just interesting to me. And probably where I'm going with this question is, are you going to keep using FPGAs or you will be, be moving out to cloud uh, and, and uh, node uh, um, architecture? And um, so when we designed this system using the FPGAs, that was really to kind of target very large corporate estates. Obviously, with that comes cost. Uh, so now that we've gone commercial with this, we are currently trying to understand how we can shrink down the performance. So for some customers, actually, packet loss due to being able to extract the, the data out of the packets may not be that important. They want to see the general case rather than the absolute. So in some cases, we are looking to remove the requirement for FPGA. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please round of applause for Sam.